Well, hello and welcome to Outdoor Oklahoma. I'm Todd Craighead. Just when we think we've seen and done it all here in our great state, well, a story totally takes us by surprise. Recently, my uncle introduced me to his gunsmith, and sure, I've known a few gunsmiths over the years, but this gentleman's story and presence here in Oklahoma is something that's truly unique. Born in France, J.J. Peridot knew at a very early age that he wanted to work on guns. Fast forward nearly 40 years, and he's now considered by many as one of the world's foremost master gunsmiths of double-barreled rifles and shotguns. His customers send him guns from literally around the world. Well, he may have been born overseas and still have an accent, but he's also a proud Oklahoman now as well. And a little bit later, we're going to join up with our resident outdoor kitchen expert, Luann Waters. But first, enjoy getting to know J.J. Peridot. Yeah, born, born in France, as you spotted with the accent. Um, I grew up in, 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 a, in a family that was interested by guns and hunting. My dad was a, a family doctor, but always liked his, his guns. So I grew, up, I grew up around guns, and um, a good friend of my dad, Michel Bernet, was, was a gunsmith in a little town uh, close by us. Uh, and close by us was the northeast side of France, close to the Swiss border. So as a, as a kid, I would be hanging at the gun shop quite a bit, and probably by the age of 10, I really wanted to be a gunsmith. I thought it was fascinating, and, and so I was shooting at the time quite a bit, and to uh, support my uh, my clay shooting habit, uh, I asked Michel if I could go work for him during, uh, d during the holidays and uh, he took me on so I would clean, you know, I would clean A5 and 1100 Remington and strip them and clean them and do, you know, small work for him and he would pay me with a 12 gauge shell and a clay pigeon. You know, like, like, uh, like here, you leave high school around 18 and, uh, and I went directly to the, to the gunsmithing school then, spent my three years, so I was on the, on the job market around 21, 21 and a half. The, the, the gun trade in Europe was in, was in peril, uh, mainly because of politics and anti-gun sentiment and uh, gun control and legislation. Uh, so I, I thought since I, I, I truly liked the, the, the work and the trade, I thought, you know, probably one, one of the few countries that was still gun friendly and, 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 and friendly and, and had a dynamic trade was the, the United States. Uh, so I sent some, I think I sent about 30 letters around the United States to, uh, to, to you know, custom maker and manufacturer. And the first answer, actually on the 30 letter, I got only two answers. One answer was from Champlain Firearm in, uh, in Enid, and the other was from Packmire in, uh, in California. <clears throat> so I you know, gave, gave priority to Champlain being the first, uh, um, but I visited them in the summer of 89 and we discussed what it would take and how I would come here and uh, they started the paper and in June of 90 that's why I landed in uh, in Enid, Oklahoma and uh, and spent 26 years with uh, with Champlain but especially my dad was uh, was incredibly happy because he, uh, he, he, he knew uh, that, that this country still had a future when Europe had uh, not as good a future. And, and you know, open the TV, read the paper, and uh, Europe have some problems. And, uh, and they will not soon be in, being dealt with. Uh, I don't do I don't do handguns. I don't do semi-auto. I don't do lever gun. Um, 
there is plenty of people that know about them, uh, even bolt action. I've, I've, I still work on bolt action, mainly big caliber African stuff. But the, the main thing gonna be high grade, side by side shotgun, a lot of big bolt double rifle like these guys behind me. Uh, that that is the the thing I, I truly specialize. Um, open a book about caliber, and I've got I've got probably 300 Chamber Reamer, and I cover just a very narrow segment of the gun trade. Thing one service I do offer is uh, you know gun fitting, and that's a uh, that is a tri gun, so that will pretty much be able to uh, to adjust practically every dimension uh, drop of the comb drop of the heel we can change the pitch we can change the cast on it for right-handed shooter or left-handed shooter and that that guy will conform whatever the shooting need and the shooter need and that's uh, th that's a try again and that's that's very helpful to find somebody's dimension the cast is pretty much the deflection of the stock to the right or to the left depending if you are a right hand shooter or left hand shooter the guns should not be straight they should actually do have that advantage and normally on a side by side with the uh, the line of the barrel the, uh, the cast that gonna be off for right hand shooter on for left hand shooter is on average about three eighths of an inch at the comb. The drop is from the line of sight, the drop gonna be drop at the comb, drop at the heel. On a quail gun, you want to see a bit of your rib because you want your gun to throw a shot column be a bit high because at the flush the birds are coming up so you want to be on the bird even if you cover it you still want your your shot column to go up and that you will adjust it with the drop uh, skeet shooter or trap shooter a very little drop they want to see a whole lot of their barrel because they want to shoot really high they want to be they want to follow that a target but actually the, the, the shot column be probably a foot higher than act, the actual axis of the uh, of the side plane. Somebody that has been used to a gun too short all its life or, or to a given configuration it would be in my book ridiculous to say oh yeah you know the book say you need to shoot that dimension they probably won't hit the broad side of a barn because they are not used to it but a, a young shooter or somebody that is moving from one style of a gun to another I think will always benefit of a, of a good fitting. You shouldn't adjust a line of sight. Uh, should I put my bead here? Should I aim? It should be automatically there uh, and that comes only from a gun fit. That's why the, uh, the African PH and the African Hunter like double rifle. You want a double rifle to fit like a shotgun. Well, this, a lot of the time, they look like a shotgun. Uh, we've got a 500 Nitro here, Holland build. If a, if a Cape Buffalo come out of the bushes 20 feet from you, and you have to do that and shoot it, you're not gonna want to look for your bead, you're not gonna want to look for the V. When you point it at him and you fire, you are looking at the middle of his forehand and, and that's where the bullet gonna hit if the gun fit you. If you have to, to bend your head and flatten your face on the cheek to get, to get your sights, um, that not gonna happen fast. So when, when you bring that rifle, it has to be there. And when you pull that trigger, if the gun fit you, it gonna hit where you look. Uh, and, and only where you look. You, 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 will, you will not have the time for your, for your iron sight or your, 
your, your, your expansive scope or it's, uh, it, it has to be, you know, a fraction of a second and if everything works, the, that, that cape buffalo are gonna, gonna, you know, skid all the way to your feet. You know, I still enjoy the sight, the feel of a, of a nice one. Not every piece is, 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 is the same, but some of them are absolutely masterpiece. Uh, the average gun I worked on, if I were to put a, an average date, I'm gonna say probably 1925. So they are, they are bordering on antique, uh, but they are, they are antique that, uh, that, that will serve their purpose right now. All these double rifles, you're gonna, you, can, you can take a 1920 gun in good shape and, 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 and go flatten a, a Cape Buffalo this afternoon, they, 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 they were well built and the one that have been well, uh, well maintained are, are totally modern uh, and, and, and are able to do the work as well as a brand new rifle. Well, I've got a confession to make. As I was leaving JJ's shop that day, his wife had made and sent home with me some authentic French chocolate eclairs. They were, without a doubt, fantastique. <laughs> well, now let's shift gears and catch up with our resident outdoor kitchen expert, Luann Waters, as she whips up another fantastique recipe in her Dutch oven. Our recipe that we're doing today is called wild game roll-ups, and wild game kind of an all-encompassing term because you can use this recipe for so many different types of game. Now, today we're using pheasant and using the breast out of the pheasant, and I've... Uh, let it marinate overnight in olive oil and had already cut it in about the size pieces that we need. Uh, but this works great with sandhill crane and with any venison, elk, uh, especially with tenderloin if you really want to, to have those be good. But you basically can just take a piece of meat. Let me get these bags open so that we can get to all the pieces. Um, and depending on the size of your peppers, uh, this is jalapeno pepper. I also have poblanos, a uh, much milder pepper if you want to use something like that. But you can lay the meat in there and if I can find another small piece, nope, that's probably going to be it. And then put a slice of onion on the other side. And then you want to use thin bacon to wrap around that's going to hold all of this together. And depending on how long the strips are. I went ahead and cut these in half and probably should have left them whole. Uh, but you can wrap these around and can use toothpicks if you need to, but you should be able to have the seam side down of the bacon and put that down and put it either on a baking sheet if you're doing these in your oven at home or outdoors uh, in a Dutch oven. So, I'll just go ahead and lay some more of the peppers and the onions out. And we'll do a combination with the poblanos. So there's not any even extra seasoning added with these because you're going to definitely get enough uh, from the pepper and the onion. A lot of times I will even fix these without the onion because I can't eat the onion uh, that much anymore. So. And then once we've got all of these prepared, we will uh, bake these until the bacon is done. Because by the time the bacon, uh, that you can tell that it's done, uh, the pheasant will be done as well. Now, the poblanos that I got are just big enough. I could probably, the strips that I'd cut, go ahead and cut those in half, again, lay the meat on, a piece of onion, and then wrap it with the bacon. And you just can keep doing that until you get all of the meat used and all of the bacon, and you'll have Wonderful. These are, make a great hors d'oeuvre. You can serve them with different sauces. Uh, there's a couple of sauce recipes that go 
really well with this, but just even spicy mustard is great uh, to use with this. So we ran out of bacon, had more meat than I realized, but we still had some pepper and some onion. So we're going to be able to still cook the rest of the meat. And I'll have peppers and onions in underneath to keep it hopefully from sticking. Uh, and it's marinated in enough olive oil, I would think that that will help keep it from stipping, sticking as well. So now we've got all of this in on the uh, 14 inch Dutch oven. And again, the formula for how many coals to use when you're baking anything, you want to uh, double the size of the diameter of your oven and have more coals on top than underneath. So you have three more coals on top than you do underneath. So we'll be getting this on the fire here in just a minute. Okay, now our coals for these wild game roll-ups have actually burned smaller than what's ideal. So normal full-size coals we would have, for a 14-inch oven, we would have 11 under, underneath the oven and 17 on top. But with these being so small, we're going to just group them together, and that way we can go ahead and have the oven be heating up. And actual cooking won't start, though, until we get fresh hot coals in underneath this. But utilize what coals you've got to let the process get started, and we, then we've started another uh, chimney of coals before it'll actually get to cook. So then we'll put the oven down over those coals, check to see if I got the spacing right. If when you go to set the oven down, you can tell it's not setting level, that means one of the legs is hitting some of the coals, and you can just kind of shuffle it and then look around the oven and make sure that you've got coals just in under the edge all the way around. Baking especially, you don't really need heat in the middle underneath the oven as much as you want to make sure your coals are evenly spaced underneath so you don't have a hot spot and have an area that will get burned even when you're trying to turn the oven. So as soon as these coals are of a usable heat, we'll add those to the top, more underneath, and then we'll know to really start counting our cooking time or uh, observing when the bacon is done that the rest of this is probably going to be about 10 to 15 minutes and uh, but it'll feel longer than that since we're not starting with full coals. Now it's good to remember when you're baking uh, that there's, I don't know who figured out this formula, but I'm sure glad that they did, that you can double the diameter of your oven so that this being a 14 inch oven, we need 28 pieces of charcoal to get to about 350 degrees. But heat rises, so you want less coals, less heat under the oven than you do on top so that you aren't burning whatever you're cooking. And when we're using this formula for coals, it's for a full freshly lit bro briquette, not a partial one like that little one is or if they've burned longer than they should have to give you the most heat. So I should have 17 on top. I can go ahead and add a couple of extra on either side. And again, you want spacing of the coals even on top of the oven to be evenly spaced so you don't get a hot spot uh, and have something get too brown. And because I know our coals underneath weren't at full heat, I'm going to set this off long enough to add more coals in underneath and again space them evenly around. We won't necessarily even count that one and then see if we can't find some others back in this chimney that are lit to get to our 11 that we need underneath. And 
and there's little enough heat. Again, there'd be enough heat that you'd get burned, but little enough heat to actually help with the cooking that I'm not going to worry with moving these partially burned coals out of the way. And then again, once you've got your coals in place, to remember that about every three to five minutes when you're baking that you'll want to pick your oven up, give it about a quarter turn, set it back in place, and you could see that time that that one settled where it started out sitting on one of the briquettes, but then the briquette moved. And so from this point we can start figuring in about five or ten minutes that we'll uh, or 10 minutes and we'll check and see how the cooking is going on these. Now again with baking, it's good to get in the habit of giving your oven about every three to five minutes, about a quarter turn, and then set it back down. You'll want to look in under the oven because it's possible you might have messed up the arrangement of your coals underneath and you don't want to create a hot spot after you've worked uh, so hard to not have any of those and adjust your coals as needed. But for us here in Oklahoma, we can plan on there. There's always going to be at least a slight breeze, if not a gale. And whatever side that the wind is coming from can keep that side of an oven cooler. And so by rotating it, you're evening out the heat all the way around with your oven and things will bake uh, much more even that way. Oh, wow, they sure look good. And probably another five minutes and we'd be done. We'll turn some of them over. Just, they look like they're cooking evenly as they are. But we'll, especially the meat that we added that didn't get rolled up with the bacon, but since we ran out of bacon, I'll flip that over to make sure that it is all getting cooked. And depending on how crisp you like your bacon, a lot of people would consider these to be done even right now. I'll let them cook just a little bit more. It's probably the moisture from the onions. We've had a lot of liquid cook out of these, which is probably why they might not have browned as much as they would have otherwise. As they say on a lot of cooking shows, we wish you could smell this. Because it does smell good. Now in case I hadn't mentioned earlier, besides baking these in the oven at home, typically when we do these at home, we actually cook them on the grill. And because of the fat in the bacon, you want to be careful about getting flare-ups as that bacon fat would drip onto your either uh, gas grill or on coals. You don't want these to get burned, so you might actually still want to lay them on a sheet of foil uh, so that you don't get those flare-ups and have uh, the roll-ups get burned if you are cooking them on the grill. So just a few more minutes and these will be done. There we go. So the wild game roll-ups, this time made with pheasant, the bacon has browned very nicely and these are definitely ready to be able to serve. So we'll plate some of these up. They're still going to be hot, but they're also going to be good. Well, I hope with this recipe that you've learned even more about the versatility of Dutch ovens and how fun they can be to cook in, not only for uh, traditional dishes, but wild game dishes especially too. If you enjoy already being in the outdoors anyway because you hunt and fish or like to hike and camp, take along a Dutch oven and enjoy your meals in the outdoor as well. Thanks for joining us today. For all of us at your wildlife department, I'm Todd Craighead and we'll see you right back here next time on Outdoor Oklahoma.